Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar slash panel discussion. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I have the privilege of kicking things off today. Uh, you can also see on our screen uh, the panelists for today who will be introduced uh, shortly. Uh, today's webinar is actually a lead up to the annual TWI and CADA summits, which will actually take place March 8th, the week of March 8th and the week of March 15th. Uh, these are, events are being held virtually and are dubbed uh, the Pajama Pants Summits, which is what you can see in uh, my background there. Uh, because we are going to be uh, doing this virtually via Zoom. Technically, you could be wearing pajama pants and comfy slippers during the summit. Nonetheless, the beauty of uh, these summits is if you register for one of them, you can attend the other for free. So essentially two weeks worth of content uh, for the price of one. If you'd like to learn more about either of those summits, visit leanfrontiers.com slash summits. Just a couple points of logistics before we get started. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded. So look for an email uh, after we finish with a link to the recording. And please do share this with others in your organization uh, as I have no doubt this will be some great conversation and content. Uh, we will be fielding questions during this session, but not live questions. Uh, many uh, of you that registered submitted a number of questions, really good questions, and that's what we'll be running with today. So with that said, let me introduce uh, our moderator for today's panel discussion, Oscar Roche. Oscar is based in Australia, works closely with clients to realize organizational change, develop people's capability and meet their business improvement goals. Uh, he's been, become quite the Kata and TWI thought leader and practitioner and uh, Lean Frontiers regularly calls on his thought leadership. So Oscar, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, getting this panel together and I'll turn it over to you. Dwayne, thank you. Very complimentary as you've been before and I appreciate it, so thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks for everyone who's joined us this morning. As I say at the start of all these th other things that I've done, um, you have a choice and you've made the choice to join us or you'll make the choice to watch the recording and the four of us certainly appreciate that. So before we get into the questions, let's, I'll quickly introduce the three uh, contributors. So firstly, Melanie, we've got Melanie there bottom uh, left of the screen. So Melanie started a career at a local hospital over 20 years ago as a student X-ray tech She's now the Chief Operations Officer of the, for the NEA Baptist Health System, which employs over 2,000 uh, employees with a wide range of professional diversity from facilities maintenance to physicians. But the main thing about Melanie is, I think I first met Melanie about um, two or three years ago when she was speaking at a TWI summit. And, and as soon as she stood up, it was pretty clear that she has passion and enthusiasm for A, what she does, and B, the impact that uh, practicing job relations has had on her life. So she was a pretty obvious choice when this um, uh, the, the question of who's going to be involved in this panel came up. So Brad, who's top left of the screen, has spent 33 years in the public sector in New South Wales, which is one of our Australian states. 21 of those, he was a police officer, and I never met him during that time, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, with the remaining 12 years in local government, last 12 years in local government in New South Wales, so again, in terms of uh, getting Brad on a panel like this, he's had many and varied situations over his career where his uh, results that he needs to achieve have been dependent on others. And particularly in his policing time, I imagine that was pretty interesting. But we've known Brad now for about six or seven years, I think it is. Uh, and certainly he's had some, some wide and varied situations where he's needed to get his results through others. So again, he was an obvious choice in a panel like this. And the fact is he's an Australian and therefore he's easy to understand. Um, Lou, Lou Flashpoller, who we've got top right, uh, is a practicing rheumatologist in Cincinnati, Ohio, serving as the division head of rheumatology at the Christ Hospital. Uh, he, one of the things that really impressed me about Lou, and I probably, uh, I've met him a few times, but we had a, um, a master's meetup in uh, last year in Austin. Uh, and Lou got us onto the topic of servant leadership. 
and and the importance of that as a uh, frontline leader and as a as a manager. And and one of the characteristics of that is humility. And I suspect that Lou uh, has that in spades because his achievements and successes, I think, are probably far deeper than he lets on. Uh, and he's certainly extremely passionate about JR. So that's why we've got him involved in this panel. So as um, Dwayne said, a number of you have uh, submitted questions. Uh, all of you submitted questions. We got a, a heap of questions, far more than we're ever going to get through. So I've picked out about eight or nine that we're going to aim to get through. And I've picked out who they're going to be first directed to. Um, but the other two uh, can also feel free to comment as well. So the first question is to you, Lou. And it comes from Ben Dunford. So Ben, thank you very much for submitting this. I think this was a good one to start with because there'll be, I suspect, a few people in this boat. So Ben says, Lou, Ben says, I am new to JR. What have you learned from job relations that is different from lean? Dif that, sorry, that is differentiated from lean. So I love the question and, and thank you so much for submitting it. And thank you so much for the kind words, Oscar. Um, so it, my entry to lean, I was working on an, an MBA back in the late eighties and became interested in why the Americans were losing ground to the Japanese and automotives later found my way into medical school, but have always had this deep, deep passion for stewardship and, and the elimination of waste. And as a, that just pulls my soul in. But as I've learned about lean, my sense is that most of what's taught in lean is tools for process improvement. And where I think, where I think true lean occurs is in human development. My sense is that lean is all about helping every individual grow to their fullest potential. And when you can align the gifts of each individual with the work of the organization and use that work, regardless of what the work is, whether it's in healthcare where Melanie and I are, whether it's in a county government, whether it's working at Toyota, but when you can use that work and the stewardship to help grow each individual to their fullest, and as that alignment occurs and these teams are all working together, pulling in that same direction, it's helping every individual grow more fully themselves, which is promoting health in that individual. It's promoting health back in the family. So to me, I, I, that idea of lean versus JR starts to en encapsulate that this is about human development. It's about individual growth. It's about helping every individual grow to their fullest. I'd be interested to hear, does that resonate with anyone else? Am I off base here? Is that? Yeah, I saw you um, nodding there, Melanie. And I know, Brad, you would like to comment on this one. So, Melanie, you were nodding. Why were you nodding? Well, absolutely. And I think the other thing I would just expand on that is that, you know, within everything that we do in process improvement and in lean management, you really can't be successful in any of that without the development of people and without um, having a team of individuals that understands the why behind the process improvement. And so, you know, for us, I think that's why it's been so important to uh, utilize JR at every element because without great job relationships, it's really almost impossible to implement any type of process improvement work that needs to happen throughout the organization um, no matter where you work. I'll tell you <clears throat> Brad, I knew you'd yeah. like. To, I know you'd like to comment on this one. Yeah, um, I'd probably to build on Lou's point. My fascination. I went with uh, one of Oscar's colleagues to Japan only about four years ago, and that's when the light really went on about why, what, what, the, what, what the difference is is in the the way they approach things, and and it's because. I used to think it was systems, processes, all those things that uh, it was about improvement, but um, the light went on that it's, um, to quote almost one of your ex-presidents, uh, it's about the people, stupid. It's um, You go over there and and because, and it's a quite savvy in a business sense, the Toyota and those people, they, they employ people pretty much indentured for life. They can't get rid of them in a way. And so 
they stuck with them. And so they invested a hell of a lot in getting every little bit of potential out of their people. So that's why I think they've so gone so far. And now we're, we're, we're picking that back up and realizing, you know, it's not, it's not the flash business systems. It's actually about the people. Yeah. Well, one thing I'll, I'll add, I, as I've had an opportunity to talk to people from Toyota, Honda, and Patrick Grupp, I've got a sense that one of the unconscious competence at these great, great organizations is that they are looking for, in JR language, the abilities not now being used in each person's ability. So they're looking for the gifts, the talents, and the ambitions of the individual and they are putting them in a place where the wind is in the sails and they're helping keep more wind in that sails for that growth. And more and more, I'm seeing that they're saying, where are their gifts? Let's move them over here. Let's make sure we're getting in the right place. So, Lou, I really like it. One thing you said was there, and I think it might be a lag and lead situation now that I think it through very quickly you said true lean equals human development so i think what you're saying there correct me if i'm wrong is the lag is process improvement the lead is human development and almost if we develop our humans to think to to act and behave and, and in a positive sense in a certain way then process improvement will happen so if they're thinking scientifically if they're getting their results through people if they're doing all those things we're talking about well process improvement's almost going to look after itself that's almost the logic. I love it. Yeah, that's Absolutely. good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, Melanie, um, a couple of questions to you. So, uh, and these are two similar questions. Valerie Kazarin, thank you. And Jade Hudek, thank you for these questions. So, Melanie, what they say is, what is the hardest, what is the hardest conditions to building trust that you've ever met? But also, what routines can we practice for repairing trust? Yeah, thank you for those questions. Excellent questions again, uh, as have already been mentioned. We have a lot of excellent questions today, but uh, for me and what I run into in healthcare, as far as a very difficult um, challenge to, to overcome, I've seen it's because of uh, people's past perceptions of potentially their, their leadership that they've had in the past or even um, in my world where it's the, the relationship between physicians and administration, sometimes that's not always viewed as a trusting relationship. And, you know, that was a big um, eye opener for me when I stepped out of the role of radiology director into a role um, as assistant administrator at the time is that um, I found that suddenly the same physicians that I had worked with for 15 years viewed me a little differently because I'm now in administration. And um, wrong, right, or indifferent, there is a mistrust that's automatically sometimes based on uh, historical events or perceptions that, that's out there. And that was surprising for me. I was not aware that that existed in healthcare. And so, um, I found that when you have someone that has a past experience, maybe a negative experience, that that is the biggest challenge that is um, that we face as leaders is how to overcome and build a, a trusting relationship with someone who already has mistrust, maybe in the person in your previous role or past experiences that they've had with a particular job title, like for instance, administration. And so, uh, the second part of that question, so that's really the first most challenging, that was the first question of the most challenging um, obstacle that, that I tend to face. The second part of that question in regards to how do you overcome that is to me, you have to have very open uh, and honest communication with those individuals in order to build a trusting relationship. So you have to use uh, the four foundations that we learn in JR. And probably the biggest key is um, telling people in advance. Um, so having that open and honest communication, but it needs to be in advance, not after the fact. And I think in healthcare, what I've found is that's very difficult. It's probably one of the biggest challenges that we face, 
especially in corporate healthcare where things do change very rapidly and uh, information does get sent to us from, uh, from others. And so as leaders, it's really our job to be able to take that information, get it to those that need the information very as quickly as possible. Um, not, not try to sugarcoat or hide anything from individuals, but um, display that in a positive uh, light and then be able to answer the why behind it um, and, and be positive about it. I think as leaders, you know, it's very easy for us sometimes if we don't agree with a decision that's made uh, that we can, we can go into the us, they category. And we certainly don't ever want to do that. We want to make sure that uh, through JR, we learned that, you know, don't pass the buck, take ownership and make sure that you're getting that information to those who need it quickly. Um, so for us, we've set up cadences of where we meet with our physician groups, at least on a quarterly basis to give information that's, that uh, is important to the organization uh, and to be open and honest. And then we also have uh, huddle boards where we have weekly huddles at the, the frontline level to be able to share that information that's, that's throughout the organization because we, we all hear complaints of not enough communication. And I think job relations helps to reinforce that need that you really have to communicate, but you have to communicate openly and honestly and build a true trusting relationship with that individual. Thanks, thanks, Melanie. You did you very briefly said mentioned the why, and I think that's critical. Um, the the sub found. I guess one of the things we often say in in that in particular with that foundation of tell people in advance is at this point you're not negotiating a change. The change is coming. Right. Uh, so it's not about negotiation. The change is coming. And I think the thing we often miss is we gloss over the why. And so the sub foundation is help people accept the change or work with them to accept it. And such an important part of that is here's the why, because if people understand the why, we're not asking you to say, yeah, and jump up and down and agree. But if people understand the why, um, then our experience is that, uh, that uh, the, the, the acceptance of the change increases. It doesn't mean everyone jumps up and down and claps their hands. But um, it might mean, and it does mean generally, that, it, that acceptance increases. Brad or Lou, do you want to comment on that, that why aspect at all? Yeah, the why piece, I don't know. You know, what was coming to mind, I was down in, in Memphis where, Melanie, you're in Memphis, correct? I'm in Jones, I'm an hour and a half from Memphis. Okay, so Memphis has their... Um, Melanie's part of, I, I think, a, it's a multi-hospital system. And Baptist, the Baptist in Memphis is kind of the mother ship, I believe. Yes. And what was fascinating five or six years ago when I was down with Skip Stewart and Patrick Grupp was that their leaders changed. They didn't change leaders, but the leaders changed. And as this work started coming in, what I saw was a movement from top-down leadership to bottom-up leadership. And that support went from... I say it, you do it to, if you're on the front line, we are here to support you. Let me get things out of the way. And so these relationships started changing. And, and that I think has a huge piece to do with the trust. If, the, if those on the front line understand that I am fully, my job is to get problems out of your way, you start to build these incredible. And that was just a fascinating thing to me that these people that were their whole career was top down. They didn't change. They didn't change those people. They changed those people, if that makes sense. So those people changed. And, and I think that the, the trust that built up in that organization from that was amazing to me. So. Thank you, Lou. And thanks, Melanie. So Brad, a question to you, and this has come, and Kim, if I, if I get the pronunciation of your surname wrong, I apologize. This is a question, Brad, has come from Ken Dunnybacky, or Dunnybacky, and she asks, uh, he or she asks, what do you recommend, and I, and I knew this might be a good one for you, because you've got to a new role, what do you recommend for a new manager who has been with the company for less time the sub, from their subordinates, and that, that will be you? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it, and it touches on... Uh... I'm thinking about Melanie's question, which I probably should have been getting myself ready for mine, but... <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it, it, it comes with the new role and it, and it talks about Melanie's transition to administration. It, it, um, we called it here, um, uh, we call them the ghosts of Christmas past, so GMs of previous previous times. Um, you do have to first, um, you know, I'll put my old detective hat on, you, you should find out the culture of your organisation, um, the roots of that culture if best you can without going too crazy, but it, it's good to understand the problem. Um, if there is a cultural problem or if or the DNA of the organisation. So do your best to understand why people are feeling the way they are. Whether So if there's high levels of trust, um, that means uh, those points that Melanie was talking about it were well in place. But if there's not, um, you understand equally that there was an organisation that wasn't giving out information or it might have been closed. So... The, it's almost in my experience to understand the wounds that might be there. Um, so you are sensitive to that and respecting your people. Um, but equally, you have to then be, have a, um, and again goes back to the previous question, um, when you are turning up and trying to implement change, um, it does have to be the why. And if, the, if there's no trust, uh, trust is interchangeable for reliability. So you've got to be consistent all the time. Um, and that's what people learn to, to, to deal with. That, that, that if, if you're consistent, um, they can then rely on what you're going to do. And unfortunately, that can be a negative thing. And that's why some organisations have a negative culture because they can rely on their management not doing the right thing, not listening to them, um, not empathising, all those, those things. But if they can rely on you to do the same thing, things you say and you're going to do those things, um, so you've got to have that consistency from the start and not be changing changing direction so you got to pick your course and stick to the language is important and 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 with 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 a new organization if you, you learn what they what their fears are um you can then um un, have more empathy and understanding and you'll find you'll i believe you'll you'll get to where you've got to get to a bit quicker which is that that level of trust um so and, and it's all about what Melanie was saying being open and honest um, when you've come into a place and, and your vulnerability, you'll be open with your people that you don't know a lot of things. Um, all, all those things are important uh, when you start in a, in a new organisation with new people. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I'd say is 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 fi understand your people, but but be consistent. You've got your direction, set it clearly, and keep articulating it the same way and support them through it. Again. I think you just tucked in there, you said that you need to understand the wounds and you mentioned the fears, Brad. In, um, get, in step one of uh, handling a people problem, we talk about getting uh, opinions and feelings. And I know this is something that, I, that it took a while for the penny to drop on that one with me, is that people's opinions and feelings are facts to them. And that took a long time to sink into my head. I, could, I, I heard the words, but it took... A long time to sink in that how someone thinks and feels is a fact to them and it's absolutely irrelevant whether it, whether it's right or wrong it's completely irrelevant if they think it then if they feel it or it is they or they think it then to them it's a fact and i think that's what you're touching on there and so and it is it is for us for for the leader to respect that and not argue against it or not fight it there's absolutely no point in fighting it. In fact, I believe if you fight it, you're probably going to make it worse. It's accepting yeah. the fact that, that how they think and how they feel is facts to them. And I think that's a major step in moving forward, how you have in the organisations that you've gone to and for all of us to move forward in uh, getting results for people. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and local government, which is my field, we, um, there is a, uh, it's a long-term employee environment. So they, they can carry those wounds um, and, and, and things from the, something the general manager might have said to them 10, 15 years ago and only seen them twice. Um, so, you know, you've got to just understand where, where, where the trust or lack of trust comes from. And, uh, but, but equally, like you, you can't change course and pander to every individual's um, concerns um, if, if they're con and they're running contrary to the organisation's values and goals, but uh, understand understand what's going on is the important thing. What are the yeah. problems? And Lou, I imagine the, that opinions and feelings is an important, is a critical aspect in your world and the medical world and how people think and feel. Absolutely. And I agree with you 100%. You don't, you don't fight it. But 
you know, I was thinking as you were talking about that, Oscar, one of the gifts I've seen in you is the ability to, to tease out and to understand that more deeply. Tell me more about that. I mean, I, I love last year at the TWI Summit, a question would be asked to you. And as opposed to answering whoever brought that question up, you would turn it back to the audience and say, let me get your thoughts. Or you would turn back on the person and tell me, tell me a little bit more about that, which values it regardless of what the, the question is or the thought is and, and honors it perhaps. Well, thank you, Lou, but that was only because I had no idea of the answer. <laughs> um, no, appreciate that. I do do that quite deliberately because I don't know the answer. Um, all right. So, Melanie, a question to you, and this comes from someone I know quite well, Patricia Bauchewski, who um, works does some work with the Institute and is from Poland. Um, Good day, Patricia, if you are uh, listening. That's great. And thanks you for joining us. So Patricia says, what kind of KPIs do, we, do you have in terms of job, sorry, what KPIs in terms of job relations are you uh, measuring? So Melanie, if you could start with that one. What kind of KPIs do you measure as far as job relations is concerned? Sure. So we, uh, one of the things, and I, I think maybe another question that was asked at some point was that kind of was our start into um, tracking our KPIs was, that um, how do you deploy um, job relations in the organization? And, you know, for us, we use Kata um, to deploy our um, JR efforts. And so we wanted to make sure that we were not training for the sake of training. So we had very intentional um, uh, outcome metrics that we wanted to be able to track through our Kata process. So um, I have a few of these here that I'll go over, but. Uh, we wanted to track our engagement score. So we do an employee and physician engagement survey every year. And so we wanted to make sure we were improving uh, our, our physician and employee engagement score. Uh, we also wanted to track our written warnings and our involuntary terms because we believed and we hypothesized that if our managers, if our leaders were getting in, if they were doing good the, the four foundations, building a good job relationship, having good touch points with their employees, that they would learn problems earlier in the process that would not make it to human resources. So when we talk about a written warning or an involuntary term, that is those problems that we talk about that are um, we run into, right? So we want to not run into problems. And if we're using the foundations, we should not be having as many um, HR related issues. So we wanted to reduce those. So we started tracking our written warnings and we started tracking our involuntary terminations and how those were doing uh, each month in relation to the year previously. Uh, we also wanted 100% of our managers uh, and above to be trained on job relations and to be able to continue that as we have uh, new leaders move into new roles or as we have turnover. We also wanted to utilize the um, employee survey tool. So uh, there is that uh, the survey for employees that ask how your leader is doing in regards to the four foundations. So we wanted to uh, make sure that 80% of our employees identified that their supervisor was using JR. Uh, so that was another KPI. And then we also wanted to reduce our turnover rate. So we, we started tracking that as well. So one of the things we learned as we started the survey is it's real, of employees, it's really hard to ask an employee how their leader is doing in regards to the four foundations if they don't know anything about the foundations. So we had to back up, part of our cotto was to back up and to say, well, we're gonna have to, before we give them the survey, we're gonna have to do a short presentation on just the high level of job relations, what we expect um, from their supervisors, the training that the supervisors have gone through. Um, so we go through quickly the four foundations as well as the four step method. And then we also kind of relate it back to them as coworkers to use JR with each other, to not jump to conclusions, not make assumptions. Opinions and feelings matter. They're all facts, regardless if they're not your opinions or feelings. So uh, those were kind of some of the steps and things that we learned through Kata um, in regards to 
what KPIs that, that we felt that we needed to be tracking. Good, thanks, Melanie. And that, that reference to Carter, so what I understood you mean by that is, it is in essence, you deployed or used scientific thinking in the application or the building of the JR capability in the sense that each of your steps was an experiment. Yes. Um, you, it was, each step in essence is a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So um, you're unsure, hypotheses aren't definite. You learn from those, um, the outcomes of each step and adjusted as you went. I assume that's what you meant by that. So yeah, spot on. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we had intentional, so that was a weekly, we, you know, kata typically, we would, we would do a kata project, we would do a daily routine to a daily experiment. With this, we envision this more of a, a project-based kata, so every week yeah, yeah. we would get together, um, some of the, the subject matter experts, we would get together and we would talk about what we had done last week, what we'd learned, and then what next step we were going to um, go through. Perfect. Well done. Thank you for that. Thanks, Oscar, Melanie. Before you jump on, Oscar, one thing that Melanie, that I've, I've learned an incredible number of things from Melanie. And one of the things she said at one of the talks I saw that gets along these lines is that every time a JR issue came up where they had to go to a, a, the opposite side of the card from the four tap foundations, when they did root cause analysis, it was because they dropped the ball on one of the four foundations. To me, that was an incredibly profound thing that you shared. And I, I think you can probably tie that back to KPIs. Where on our KPIs were we, where did we drop that? Mm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add on one thing that Lou helped me remember is, for us, human resources was so critical to be a, a part of that. So our HR director was one of the certified trainers alongside me that really was helping lead these efforts. And um, because you have to know in order, you know, HR, when they get that, um, that four step method form, because we would ask a, a manager before you submit for disciplinary action or anything to HR, we want you to provide that form for us showing that you've gone through the four step method and used JR. We also wanted HR to ask the question, which one of these foundations could have helped you, you know, to keep you from maybe getting to this, this point with this employee. So again, HR is vital, in my opinion, um, to be su very successful in truly um, sustaining your JR efforts. You know, you can train, you can get the training accomplished, but um, you have to make sure you're monitoring these KPIs and you're, you're then having very close con connections with HR and that they're, because they have to provide you a lot of this data. Lou, I love that comment. I like that comment you made there. Now, what I find that I'm starting to do is, I, and hopefully not too late, is when the JR line wobbles, when the, when the JR line wobbles between me and someone, the first, what I'm tending, what I'm trying to do and what's tending to happen is I look at the four foundations and say, oh, which one of those did I miss? And almost inevitably, it's one or more of them. So it's an interesting comment you make there. And that, what you just mentioned about HR, uh, well done, because that um, feeds into the next question I've got listed and question for you, Brad, because I think you've had, a, particularly in your previous role, had a fair bit of involvement in this. And it comes from Christine Otterson. So thank you, Christine. Um, the question is, what role does HR play with the role out of JR? Who were your initial trainers and what are the advantages to HR with JR? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and uh, people, we call, we're calling it in my new, new organisation, we call it People and Culture, um, trying to get rid of the old lingo of uh, HR. But um, the, the obvious answer is uh, H, People and Culture or, or HR are responsible for our human capital. Um, and coordinating our approach and reg ensuring that uh, the organisation is integrated in its approach and that consistency, uh, which gets us all into trouble so much with our people. If different departments treat their people differently, um, you can have a lot of problems. So the, you ca ca cannot not have, I would say this, if you're going to be successful, if, you, if your HR team is siloed and to use the term not on board with, with JR or TWI in the process, you're setting a change 
up to fail, in my opinion, um, because fundamentally they are the, I suppose, the watchers of, of of what goes on in the organisation in that sense, and should, and if they aren't at least um, engaged and fully across the principles uh, and foundations, um, you're going to run into trouble. So they're vital in the first instance. I'm only at an early stage. We've only I've only been there 18 months, um, but. We're working towards, I've only got a very small shop, obviously, only four, four in, uh, in people and culture, but all of those people I envisage hopefully being trained the trainers in, in JR. Um, it forms part of our, our, our disciplinary framework, for want of a better term. We've, we were using a thing which, uh, which your colleague brought to us, which was originally called standards behaviours. We've adapted to call it safe and respectful behaviours in the organisation which is founded on the, the JR principles. So they're, they're, they are fundamental in, in essence. Um, and if, if, if you've got a, and I'll be blunt, if you have got a HR team that doesn't get it, you've got a problem. Well said. <laughs> Melanie, why are you laughing? I like that, that last statement. If you, if you have an HR department that doesn't get it, you have a problem and a hundred percent agree. Right, so without sp speaking out of turn, um, as such, or saying you things you shouldn't. Are you smiling and laughing because that happened and you've had to adjust, or you just had previous experience in that? Or uh, yes. they may be watching, Melanie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no comment. So, so no, my question was: How did you rectify that? That's what I'm leading to. I don't want you to talk about that. Obviously, you know, I imagine it's been rectified, or you're working on that. Yeah. How do you go about that? I think that uh, if that were to happen, I think that having the KPIs in place well said. Um, and a status update um, to make sure that that you are, um, you know, for us with Kata, that that um, that did end after we deployed, but it really cannot end. And so one of the learnings that we had is that um, we did take our eye off the ball for a period of time. And uh, so now we've restarted a status A3 specific to job relations um, with these, these KPI on there so that we can, can have our um, obstacles and our next steps and still use that scientific thinking through um, a status A3. Okay. And, and so that really helps keep everyone on the same page. And, and so I think that's very critical. Thank you. So it's at 37 minutes, we allowed 40. I am going to ask one more question. So there's, um, to the people who are out there live, I can see there's uh, a good number of you. We will go over the 40 minutes, uh, I, uh, letting you know in advance about a change that's going to affect you. And the reason we're going to do it is because I think this question is valuable and I'm pretty sure Lou's going to have a strong answer. So this is the last question, Lou. It comes from Joachim Anto Anteo. And he says, it's a sort of a double-barreled question, Lou. He says, how do we get started on JR? But I think that what I really liked about the question is the next bit. He says, what is needed before JR can be started? How do we get started and what's needed before JR gets, can get started? Yeah, I love it. I loved it too. Incredible question. So What's been fascinating to me on this journey is having the ability to talk to people like Oscar and Patrick and others who have been on a, the journey for many, many decades. And the question that, that I brought up with the, this master's group last year and others was um, of all the organizations that you have worked with, how many of them have sustained this over the long run? And almost universally, people that have been at this for oftentimes decades or longer, the response is a very small number have sustained it over the long run. And the follow-up question for me then is, are there universal threads that you see in those organizations that have sustained it? And I've, with all these things, I've had hypotheses in my head and I, I the testing is to see if the same answers come out. And almost universally what comes out and sometimes the word servant leadership or a higher purpose drive are not used, but when you start drilling down on it, what you see in the organizations that have sustained it is that they sit on a foundation of servant leadership 
They know their values very well. Within that organization, there is accountability for everyone to hold those values. And what I love in these organizations is that the janitor is held just as responsible as the CEO to hold the CEO accountable to the values as the CEO is held to the janitor. So I, what do you need to get started? I think if you want to sustain it in the long run, those things have to be there. So a foundation of servant leadership. And I think there's got to be more than just lip service to servant leadership. There's a lot of people that, that use that term, but what does that mean? And a higher purpose drive. And as I dug deeper into what a, a purpose drive is, I've, I've come to believe that Toyota's um, values are probably universals for everyone. And they're values that I've seen from Jeffrey Likert's book in um, The Toyota Way, written back in late 90s, early 2000s is we are here to contribute to the lives of our employees and their families. We are here to contribute to the community and we are here to contribute to the economy. And everything we do should be falling within those values. So those, those pieces, the higher purpose drive, which falls on the values and servant leadership, I think are, are critical pieces. And I'd there, what was the first part, uh, Oscar, of the... The first part was, how do we get started on JR? So that, that's been a fascinating thing that I, clearly the way it was taught and has been taught is within the 10-hour programs. JR is one of the programs, J-I, J-R, J-M. But what's been fascinating to me is listening to another incredible mentor, Mark Warren talk. And Mark talks about going into manufacturing facilities in Asia and Vietnam, where he will take a few hours and start with the team, get some understanding, but immediately what he'll do is start to figure out what the problems are within the organization. And I think what he's doing is creating a pull and they, so he'll start to determine, okay, are the people problems the biggest problems within this organization? Are the process problems the biggest? And similar to the way Oscar does things, he won't give them the answer. He'll keep asking questions that will ultimately let them see that, okay, our processes are very unstable. What do you think you need to get processes stable? And then ultimately they get this idea that if we had this tool to do it and all that, well, I've got this tool called JI. Now you create this incredible pull. I don't know how he does it, but I think he's got just in time JR training that with all of these things, he's creating this pull and giving them these pieces. And I've wondered whether that, I've wondered and from what Mark tells me in the traditional method of teaching J, TW, all of these, those 10 hours, you see incredible, incredible things happen. But in as he shifted this training, the increases in each of these organizations has just gone on spade. So that's a, it's a different way of looking at it, but it's been fascinating to me to, to hear Mark talk about it and to see it in, in the sense of a pull as opposed to a push. So just a thought and something to think about. Thanks, Lou. So we are at 45 minutes, so we'll pull this up, but I'm doing it reluctantly. I see that, um, the, that the people who stayed on live, uh, I think two have dropped off now, but only, very, only in the last couple of minutes. So that is always a really strong indication that um, there's interest in the conversation. So uh, Melanie, Lou and Brad, I really appreciate what I've, I enjoy doing these things because I enjoy the, the, uh, what I learn from them and what comes out of them. And I appreciate the time you guys have put in this morning. Um, really good. There's a question from just, I will answer one question. Shane Hayes has asked, um, uh, I think it was Shane Hayes, asked what's the card that is being held up? So that's the job relations pocket card. And I probably shouldn't say this, but if you put job relations pocket card into Google, you will see it come up. 
The other way of doing it is uh, do some training in job relations and where the Institute's one of the organisations that does that. But of course, there are many others out there. But if you do the 10 hour job relations training with any organisation like ourselves, um, you will get what you're learning to the, the pocket card is a practice is a is an aid to help you practice the skills of job relations. So Melanie, Brad and Lou, uh, thank you very much for your involvement in this. And uh, Dwayne, thanks for the opportunity to deliver. And yeah, thanks, sort of Oscar. Oscar and, uh, I thanks really love doing it. Yeah, th thanks, thanks everyone. I, I'm one of uh, I'm one of those that would like uh, for this to have continued on, Oscar. This yeah, was this was great. Too. Thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone for the conversation. Um, so you will be getting an email from me shortly with a link to this recording. Uh, please do share this with others in your organization. And just uh, one final reminder. Um, a few of the things that uh, were discussed here, uh, the summits came up and the master's meetup came up. Those are all things that are taking place at the uh, TWI and, and Kata summits uh, coming up here in March. Um, so please do take a look at that. You can visit leanfrontiers.com slash summits. It's going to be a great, uh, as dynamic as you can uh, on Zoom a uh, great dynamic way of learning and interacting with your peers. We've actually got some, some, uh, some unique ways that we're going to interact and some surprises set up as well. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, thanks to our panel. Thanks to everyone who participated and we'll be in touch via email soon. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.